ಸಮುದ್ರವಸನೀ ದೇವಿ ಪರ್ವತಸ್ತನ ಮಂಡಲೆ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪತ್ನೈ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯಂ ಪಾದಸ್ಪರ್ಶ ಕ್ಷಮಸ್ವೀ ದೋಸ್ ಹು ಡೇರ್ ಟು ಫ್ಲೈ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಕೇರ್ ಟು ಲೀವ್ ದೇರ್ ಫುಟ್ ಪ್ರಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎಫ್ ವಿ ಎಸ್ Yes, okay, sir. Excellent. Okay. So, we'll continue with uh, what we were talking about in the previous class, um, which is the elements of the semi-monocoque construction. I've just given, shown you the uh, sketches of uh, schematics of uh, a typical aircraft with a semi-monocoque construction as opposed to a truss-like construction or a monocoque construction. This was the third type of construction that we talked about. and we said that um, this is the most common one especially in today's aircraft where uh, your speed and size matter so semi monocoque construction is the way to go uh, these structures might look ugly um, when you especially you're looking at a cutaway uh, some of which we saw in the previous class too uh, you can see the cutaways for a uh, whole aircraft if you go to uh, the website of the flight international magazine uh, i think it's flightglobal.net or something if you just search for flight international you can uh, check that out uh, you will see the cutaways for some uh, common aircraft many of the ones uh, which are popular both uh, in the military as well as in the civilian applications um it, they do look ugly because there's so many different components inside uh and they probably even look scary because um they are pretty much like skeletons right so and it's not for uh, nothing that skeletons are used in horror movies but at the same time both of these uh, whether it's a human skeleton or the skeletal structure which is part of the semi monocoque construction po- provide the uh, load bearing capability that is the strength stiffness and stability that is required um so we've been uh, throwing around these words strength stiffness and stability we'll look at it in a much more concrete way uh, hopefully in the next class um, uh, considering that we will complete all of what um, we uh, plan to complete in today's class uh then we'll also get on to um just the uh, initial slide in terms of uh, how do we make uh, the decision in terms of which material goes into each one of these components so that's where uh, your background in terms of the homework uh, that you uh, already did will come in handy uh, for the alh and the um, lca uh, that is the dhruv and the tejas um, the choices that were there which you explored and the reasons behind that so when we talk about material selection as we shall do throughout this course in whatever we talk about we will generally talk about um, the uh, uh, by starting with a few questions because uh, questions is are what actually lead to knowledge uh, whether you are looking at modern knowledge in terms of the technologies that we are trying to learn today or even uh, the age old uh, knowledge of life itself uh they all start with questions so unless and until you pose the right questions um you do not uh, enhance your learning uh, capabilities as well as the learning content both in terms of the quantity and more importantly the quality of what you learn and how you are uh, able to apply that so in terms of material selection we will typically ask questions like what are the materials available um why are certain choices made where are they used and how are they uh, manufactured or fabricated and utilized so th- these questions of what where how why 
these are all very significant questions that you need to ask about uh, anything that uh, you do or anything that you learn so that that way uh, you try to progress in your learning uh, much better even when you are taking notes a very good note taking technique uh, whether it's for this class or for any other classes is to uh, at the end of the class at least um, try to ask yourself a few questions on the subject that you're learning uh, what is it that you're try trying to learn why is it you're trying to learn these things um how do you go about learning these and if certain things new things have come up uh, what are they so these kinds of questions and you try to answer them yourselves then you tend to learn much better than just memorizing certain uh, things which are uh, either in the textbook or in the class notes uh, per se so this is the kind of approach that really helps in learning and i would uh, really urge all of you to uh, try uh, taking that approach as far as possible Okay, before we uh, get on to uh, understanding the components of the semi monocoque construction, is the uh, at least uh, uh, till early this morning, the results of uh, last week's poll that we had uh, in terms of uh, how your experience was in terms of the uh, speed of teaching in the uh, first four classes, that is the last two weeks of uh, flight vehicle structures. And um, uh, 26 of you uh, responded to it at that point of time. I hope. Uh, um, everybody saw this uh, poll uh, because I think there are more than 26 students in the class. So whenever there is a poll, I would like you to actually all of you to participate. So those of you who didn't do it this time, no problem. But from next time onwards, uh, please uh, ensure that you participate because we can uh, probably have a few quizzes also uh, through this particular mode. Uh, this time I made it anonymous uh, purposely, mm, but uh, because it was kind of a feedback for the course, I didn't want uh, to uh, know who is answering what specifically but uh, going forward we will make the, uh, some of these quizzes actually uh, known uh, at least to me and to the teaching assistants um, who answered what so that um, that way you get uh, some kind of uh, grading for uh, those uh, the uh, uh, answers that you uh, provide to the course uh, to the questions uh, and um, like this time uh, many a times um, of course here there's no such thing as a right answer so that's uh, why it's kind of say 0% of the respondents answer this question correctly because it's a very subjective question. Uh, depends on how your own background and um, your own learning processes, how you uh, perceive it, uh, in the speed of a particular course. So uh, there's no right answer as such. But uh, going forward uh, for some of the uh, actual content of the course that you'll be tested uh, online during the course probably or sometimes offline as well, uh, you will... Uh, uh, we would be actually uh, grading you uh, partly uh, based on these uh, responses as well. Uh, so uh, those of you who are not already uh, looking at the posts that uh, are coming up um, in the uh, chat channel of uh, Microsoft Teams, please make it a habit to look through that so uh, you're aware of what's going on and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you should be getting an email notification also, but, but even otherwise, even if you don't get a notification of the questions posted, uh, you should always make it a point to uh, check uh, uh, at least once a day uh, the each of the courses that you're uh, uh, attending, the Teams uh, channel for that, uh, the general channel usually, um, and then see if there are certain posts which are of significance there. So the results of this, of course, showed that um, most of you felt that the, uh, the speed was okay. Uh, just a couple of them or probably, uh, yeah, just a couple of them uh, felt it was uh, on the uh, higher speed side uh, uh, and a, a few on the lower speed side as well. But of course, uh, th um, in general, this will be a variable speed course depending upon the uh, complexity of the content and how I perceive that uh, how many of you would, uh, based on your own uh, varied background, grounds how you'd be able to kind of accept um, what is uh, being uh, uh 
uh, given to you th as part of this course. Uh, so there will be a certain variable speed, but uh, as far as possible, I'll probably, I think, stick to the current pace and slow down only when uh, there are difficult topics, uh, which I think uh, the non-aerospace background people might find it a little tough to uh, digest. Uh, but those of you who are already into aerospace and uh, which is probably why uh, the five of them feel slow, it's slow and one of them too slow. Um, I request you to kindly bear with me be, uh, because we need to take the whole class together. So, um, uh, as I said, uh, I, I don't know if uh, many of you saw the um, uh, what what was the response after you gave the response, uh, some kind of a feedback from my end also in terms of what you can probably do if you thought so. Uh, so, some of you can watch the uh, YouTube videos that I post in a fast forward mode instead uh, if you think it is uh, too slow especially, right? Uh, so, we'll move forward. And uh, this is the slide that uh, we left off with uh, in the previous class, uh, which is the uh, semi-monocoque uh, nomenclature. Um, so uh, the main thing is the monocoque comes from the single shell and therefore you should have a cover skin, whether it's uh, uh, aerodynamic surface like this, which, it could, which could be at either the uh, stabilizers or the wing or the uh, fuselage uh, and uh, as we saw there, there could be blended configurations as well. Uh, again, um, there is a nomenclature which has uh, arisen from uh, um, the past which, uh, in which we say that amongst the two stabilizers, one of them as the horizontal stabilizer uh, on which the elevator is mounted uh, and the uh, vertical stabilizer on which the uh, rudder is mounted. But these need not be actually horizontal or vertical all the time. Um, perhaps when the aircraft is on the ground, it's um, almost horizontal uh, and uh, vertical so whereas when the aircraft is actually flying it could be in any uh, orientation and therefore these uh, nomenclatures of um, horizontal or uh, vertical uh, no longer stand water so you do need to uh, be uh, much more specific in terms of what you're trying to control over there. So in the case of the vertical tail, uh, the rudder is the controller, but the vertical tail itself is the stabilizer. So we say it is basically a yaw stabilizer because it's trying to uh, stabilize any um, uh, divergent motion that could happen in the uh, yawing direction. That is this kind of a rotation of the aircraft. Uh, with the tips of my finger, uh, middle finger basically being the nose of the aircraft. Now, this uh, kind of a configuration, similarly, if you look at the elevator, uh, it is basically trying to control the pitch and therefore the horizontal, uh, what we call as the horizontal stabilizer conventionally is actually a pitching stabilizer, right? So it's a pitching stabilizer, where uh, the horizontal tail, whereas the uh, vertical tail is actually uh, the yawing stabilizer. Um, but of course, yaw and uh, roll are coupled. So uh, the uh, ailerons on the wing would be uh, contributing towards that as well but predominant uh, stabilization uh, so to speak is contributed by the empanage uh, by which we mean the horizontal tail vertical tail and the um, entire st uh, structure onto which it is mounted that whole uh, region is called the empanage then uh, so all of these, the common feature is that they have a cover skin, which is the shell, which is a load bearing shell in general. Uh, many a times it can actually um, be in the post buckled regime as well. So that is the um, uh, common feature. And we saw three very important reasons why uh, we need to use such a shell, irrespective of whether it is a semi monocoque construction or a monocoque construction in fact even in the truss structures that uh, right from what the Wright brothers used you would have a cloth wrapped onto uh, these truss like structures to give give it a certain aerodynamic uh, shape uh, at least minimally now, uh, of course, it would not have performed all of the function, three functions that we talked about earlier. And um, many a times it is not the main load, load bearing member that the truss elements are the ones which uh, predominantly bear the load, mostly in tension. So uh, in the, uh, on the other hand, in a semi monocoque construction, uh, the distribution uh, in terms of a weight percentage uh, between the uh, shell like uh, skin and the uh, which is thin 
and the um, rest of the uh, supporting or stiffening structures, the skeletal structure is typically 50-50. Um, it could vary from aircraft to aircraft and type of aircraft to aircraft, but uh, predominantly it is in that kind of a ballpark thumb rule that you can start with. Uh, when you're designing a structure, you do not know um, all of these. So you t tend to start with that and then you play around, optimize uh, your design and reach whatever is uh, most uh, suitable for you in terms of reducing the structural weight to the minimum. At the same time, you are uh, able to uh, perform uh, its um, function uh, within the uh, material failure limits and the geometric uh, stability uh, criteria that might be there. Uh, so, in terms of the stiffening elements, we have uh, the spars, the longitudinal stringers or longerons, and the transverse frames or ribs, which are again common to all of these three types of structures. So, we'll go through um, these three types of stiffeners after going through the cover skin in a little bit. Uh, so, let's start uh, understanding the cover skin in a little more uh, detail. The first uh, aspect is, um, we expressed this in a different fashion in the previous class also, but a more um, formal way. It transmits the aerodynamic um, uh, forces which are coming on to the uh, stiffener. So, the because this is what is actually exposed. So, the aerodynamic um, uh, forces or uh, actions uh, to which this has to react is basically uh, predominantly in the form of a pressure. But um, uh, in lower Reynolds number regimes, the shear becomes important also. Uh, many of you, irrespective of whether you're from a, a mechanical or aerospace background, would have heard this um, term, uh, the uh, Reynolds number. It's, uh, it's basically a non-dimensional quantity defined as rho into V into L divided by mu. Uh, mu being the coefficient of viscosity, rho being the density of the uh, uh, fluid through which the flow is happening. The V is the speed uh, at which the flow is happening and L is the characteristic length which in this case, for example, could be, let's say, the uh, cord length of the um, uh, wing or the uh, stabilizers. And uh, in the case of the fuselage, for example, it could be the length of the fuselage or some uh, factor of that. So, uh, you, when a Reynolds number is low, what it basically means is either it is a slow speed aircraft or it is a very small aircraft. Uh, so, which is for which you typically you will uh, uh, remember use a monocoque construction. So, uh, that's why you would see that uh, micro air vehicles or uh, nano air vehicles, uh, very small uninhabited uh, aerial vehicles are typically using uh, monocoque kind of constructions though in some cases uh, you would see let's say a carbon fiber or something acting as a stiffener or just a, a bunch of them acting as a stiffener over there but um, nonetheless most of the uh, times you would see that uh, thin shell uh, would kind of uh, do the uh, trick over there but in a semi monocoque construction you still have the skin but what it does is it transmits that uh, load it is experiencing from the external environment which is the pressure and the shear um, because the uh, in the low Reynolds number regime the shear becomes very critical uh, because uh, uh, you are having uh, rho VL by mu is very small means mu is very large uh, relative to rho VL. So basically you are talking about the um, ratio of the uh, non-dimensional ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. So compared to the vis uh, inertial forces, the viscous forces are kind of comparable um, in, in a relative sense. Uh, it's much higher. Uh, so uh, though these Reynolds numbers typically even in a low Reynolds number regime would be in the order of 10 power 4. Uh, probably which means that you still the inertial uh, forces are the ones which are dominating but compared to 10 power 6 or 10 power 7 um, 10 power 4 or 10 power 5 is smaller so in that sense the uh, lower Reynolds number is what we are talking about we are not saying that the uh, viscous forces are larger than the inertial forces of course not so uh, comparing two different kinds of aircraft one uh, let's say a passenger or a uh, aircraft or a fighter which is flying at very high speed and 
and as uh, as a much larger size compared to an MAV, a micro air vehicle, uh, you would see that uh, the passenger aircraft or the fighter has a uh, much higher Reynolds number, and therefore you can even ignore or uh, for a first cut analysis the viscous forces uh, and come back to it later for a much more detailed analysis. Whereas in the case of uh, micro air vehicle, for example, or any small aircraft and or uh, uh, sl very slow speed aircraft, uh, you will have to take into account the viscous forces right from the beginning. In other words, um, uh, from an aerodynamics point of view, you would be probably dealing with Navier-Stokes equations, at least in a numerical sense, right from the uh, beginning stages. So that's what uh, is one of the additional complexities that you get in a slower speed, uh, smaller aircraft. You might think that that's probably the easiest to handle, but um, there are uh, uh, question marks over there too. There are certain uh, mathematical complexities uh, that are involved uh, apart from the uh, technological complexities as well. Uh, uh, of course, there are uh, certain things which are e much, much easier as well uh, in dealing with them. The other uh, difficulties in terms of the miniaturization of all the components that are required uh, going down to that length scale. Uh, but thanks to the kind of uh, avio uh, the electronics that have come up with, uh, let's say, mobile phones, tablets, uh, laptops, etc., uh, there is a spin off uh, to aerospace. Usually, the spin offs are from aerospace to um, uh, many other fields. But in the case of avionics, um, there has been uh, information transfer both ways. Uh, a lot of research in um, avionics has helped um, a lot of things uh, especially in uh, space related stuff has helped in uh, improving uh, the kind of uh, personal devices that we use uh, at the same time uh, the technologies there have improved uh, the uh, avionics as well in terms of miniaturization reducing their weights uh, and their uh, longer lasting capabilities uh, harsher environment applications etc so uh, coming back to the uh, cover skin the first function is that it transmits that uh, uh, external environment load uh, be it a pressure or a shear to the stiffeners which are attached to it so you can see that um, for example these stringers are now attached to the uh, skin this attachment could be in uh, one of many different ways uh, three common ways are uh, let's say it is riveted uh, if it's uh, usually a, both a metallic structures let's say the skin is also an aluminium alloy and the um, stringer is also an aluminium alloy they could be uh, uh, separately manufactured and then riveted uh, to each other uh, <coughs> you could have in some situations especially when composites are involved adhesively bonded joints so you have a skin to which uh, which is uh, separately cured um, in an autoclave for example and the stringers are also uh, similarly cured these could be like let's say hat like structures uh, channel like structures with the lips that's basically um, uh, a channel is like this and then you have short lips uh, coming out of that and that uh, lip like uh, structure touches the uh, skin and those lips are then um, uh, uh, riveted or adhesively bonded to uh, the uh, skin on the inner side so that's uh, the stringers are not exposed to the uh, out, outer flow of the um, air uh, uh, either the shear or the pressure so that load is now transmitted uh, through those joints whether it's the adhesively bonded joint or the uh, riveted joint to the uh, stringers but uh, as i've um, mentioned a couple of times in the previous classes as well uh, moving to almost all composite aircraft um, like you have the nal uh, uh, making the national aerospace laboratories uh, in bangalore which is a csir lab uh, council for scientific and industrial research many of you might be familiar with that uh, nal uh, has two aircraft like hansa and uh, saras which employ a fairly large amount of composites as well so uh, for many of that um, uh, they have um, uh, mastered a technology of co-curing or um, at least co-bonding 
uh, structures while they are getting manufactured itself so that the bond strengths are much larger than before and you do not have actual joints because these rivets can become sources of stress concentration for example the holes that need to be there on both the skin as well as the uh, stiffening structure can cause certain stress concentrations which will uh, reduce the fracture uh, properties uh, desirable fracture properties uh, and so uh, that can kind of be avoided uh, when you go for uh, these kinds of modern uh, manufacturing uh, methodologies uh, so it's the same way in which the um, spars are also attached to the um, uh, skin and in this case the uh, way the transverse frames or at the ends the bulkheads are attached to the uh, fuselage skin um, so the next aspect about the cover skin is that it resists certain loads by itself so what are these loads that it resists by itself most of the loads major loads it's transmitting so uh, it's it's very similar when you're talking of heat also you talk of a conduction a convection a radiation right similarly uh, uh, or if you talk of light as a part of the light which is um, uh, transmitted let's say you have a surface and light is striking on it a part of the light uh, travels through it especially if it's a transparent uh, kind of a medium like glass everything uh, goes through it and then there is a certain uh, portion which is reflected um, uh, from the uh, surface uh, hopefully the reflection at the back of my uh, screen uh, uh, in the videos that you see in the YouTube are not uh, too much of a distraction but basically a part gets transmitted through a part gets reflected and a part can get absorbed also um, so whether it is light or heat or whatever similarly in this case uh, it is a mechanical load which is coming on the skin of the the aircraft and that mechanical load is now a part of it is being uh, resisted by the skin itself the cover skin itself the thin shell uh, but a part of it is major part of it is transmitted to the stiffening structures which are inside uh, portion of the skin so what is it that the uh, skin can uh, resist all by itself uh, or at least a par major part of it by itself what is it the, the the answer is two things the torque that can be there for example in the case of the um, wing uh, because the uh, pitching moment uh, is acting in, in a certain location and the uh, cg of the uh, wing cross section is at a different location there is a um, uh, moment which is a pitching moment on that airfoil cross section and that pitching moment uh, will uh, cause a torque because this is a cantilever construction a free end at the wing tip and um, which is attached at the uh, root to the fuselage so this cantilever structure undergoes a um, torque and therefore twists right so this creates a certain shear stresses and that shear stresses to a large extent will be resisted by the cover skin itself similarly the lift distribution that is there which i saw which i said is um, approximately elliptical going from zero at the wing tip all the way to the maximum at the uh, wing root now this uh, is going to cause predominantly a bending moment but it also causes a shear force so this if you think of this as a cantilever beam you are very familiar uh, in your strength of materials courses where you have plotted shear force diagrams and bending moment diagrams so those shear forces are going to cause a parabolic distribution of shear stresses at any cross section which is going to peak uh, at the uh, around the neutral axis so both of these the, and of course the drag is also going to cause uh, shear force uh, in the other direction uh, which is along the velocity direction velocity of the airflow and then uh, the uh, perpendicular to is the lift so both of these effectively are causing shear forces at any cross section um, which are at a, in a direction which is um, neither parallel to the velocity direction nor perpendicular because both lift and drag are there in addition you have this pitching moment which is a torque right now all of these uh, are all going to cause shear stresses and shear strains and most of it is going to be resisted by this uh, cover skin along with certain uh, portions like the 
shear web that you see over here you can think of this um, uh, as as uh, idealized to be an eye section beam with this portion being let's say the flange of an eye section beam and the, the, this is the lower flange and the one which is connecting both is the web now the flanges are there predominantly to take the bending loads uh, which uh, in the case of a lifting aircraft uh, this would be under compression the top flange and the bottom flange would be under tension because of the lift uh, trying to bend the aircraft wing upwards right on the other hand this web that is there along with the sir, cover skin yes sir, sorry for the interruption i have a doubt here yes please so, uh, the transfer shear force, uh, shear, shear load is an, is it parabolic? I mean, you told it is parabolic in shear. The uh, shear force, dis shear stress distribution. Correct. So, uh, obviously, the top and bottom portion of the parabolic is going to be zero. Correct. So, how, how come the uh, cover skin is going to take the... So, in, it's going to be zero at the cover skin, right? So, the transfer shear load. So, how the cover skin is going to take that uh, zero load? It's, it's not. Okay. okay. This is a doubt. Good, good. A very good question. So, um, see, there are two two aspects to it. One, one is in terms of uh, the load. Uh, the pressure load is the dominant load. But there is also a small uh, shear uh, load which is coming and which will become uh, more and more important as you go to the low Reynolds number structure. Right? Now, uh, because of the airflow, there is going to be a shear. There's a boundary layer which forms and there's going to be a shear. So it's not exactly going to be zero. It's going to be close to uh, zero. Uh, and you also know that, um, probably let me um, see if I can just catch this for you. Are you able to see a different screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. So let's say this is the uh, particular cross section of the um, airfoil, uh, let's say on the wing, right? Now, you know that if you take, uh, uh, I purposely drawn it a little thicker, uh, let's say, now, um, let's say we take a small element over there, right? Now, if you just uh, blow this up over here, this is the outer surface, which is, um, let's say, facing a small uh, shear stress, which is uh, coming over there, right? Now, that uh, if this is not a magnetic material which usually it is not uh, you would have a complementary shear stress of equal value uh, coming up over there this is an element right at the top right now you see that you have the shear stresses which are developing over there now on the other hand what we are talking about is let's say there is a Pre, uh, the flow is in this particular direction this is the velocity of the um, air which is flowing over the airfoil cross section now this um, speed of the air is going to cross not only these uh, shear uh, stresses that are there over here but also it's going to cause um, let's say uh, let me just turn off the notifications for a while yeah so now uh, it's also going to cause a pressure drag but either of these in as the aircraft as far as the aircraft is concerned because in the case of the aircraft uh, let's say the, this um, this particular thing that is uh, there is in terms of for this can, uh, cantilever beam which is the wing uh, whose cross section is what we are basically looking at over here you would see that um, it is like a shear force so if you treat that as a cantilever and take this as the let's say the uh, fixed end and this is the uh, beam itself you're seeing that 
um, if, if you see this from a top view, let's say this is the top view of the aircraft um, uh, and in that case you're basically having the velocity of the air which is like this, which is in this case shown at a cross section over here. Now at any given cross section you're going to have a certain shear force which is coming because of that drag distribution. So it's a drag distributed over the airfoil cross section, uh, some arbitrary uh, drag distribution let's say. Now this is the uh, load distribution over there, uh, force per unit length, uh, some Newton per meter that you have over there. Now that uh, is going to, yeah. Uh, so that is going to uh, cause um, the shear stresses in that particular cross section. Now that particular cross section is what I have shown in green over here. And on that uh, skin, you are actually having, let's say not uh, zero thickness, uh, it's a small thickness, but it is going to have a finite thickness over there, right? Now what I showed over here is an element which is going to get something, let's say a tau. Um, which is basically coming uh, from uh, some, uh, let's say, some tau ij acting on the i surface uh, in the j direction, which is, which means that the normal to the surface is in the i direction, and uh, the direction in which the uh, stress itself is acting is the d j direction. This tau ij is what is um, over here. Now, that is uh, basically coming from the uh, external boundary layer theory or whatever. But as you go to an inner element, because this is a thick element, I take an inner element over here, you're going to have not the boundary condition coming from the outer, but actually from the uh, previous um, uh, whatever element that you have. Now, this is kind of going to get added up because you have these stresses not only coming in this direction, but in the other direction as well, because the lift is also going to have some kind of an elliptic distribution like this, uh, which is what I was talking about. So this is in the other direction. If you have a sideway um, view of the aircraft, then you're going to have the, uh, let's say this is the um, uh, lift distribution in a Newton per meter uh, kind of a fashion. And this is along the span of the aircraft, uh, let's say Y, right? Now, L is going to be a function of Y, again, once again in uh, Newton per meter, much larger than the drag distribution that you have over here. Uh, this also will be ma maximum at the root. Now, uh, both of these are going to uh, cause the shear uh, uh, forces on that cross section and that has to be resisted and these stringers that you have over there all over which are kind of either riveted or uh, jointed and even the spar that you have over here uh, let's say a friend spar and you also have let's say a, a rear spar over here now uh, these spar caps and these stringers that you have um, are not good enough in taking those uh, shear stresses. It is the skin which has a much larger um, uh, length or a flow to take place of the shear. Uh, some of these terms we'll visit in a much more formal sense as we go forward. But uh, basically you see that uh, these are the ones which are more capable so, and as far as the lift distribution is concerned the spar um, webs the, these are the webs the spar webs these play uh, uh, this as well as this now these two are also going to play a major role in fact this whole thing can be considered to be a box what we call as the wing box so you have a front spar you have a rear spar and then you have the uh, skin which is basically connecting them so you have a box like structure over there and that box uh, takes these shear forces coming from the lift and drag as well as the torque which is coming from the uh, pitching moment so remember that there is going to be a, a lift there is going to be a drag and there is going to be a pitching moment okay so all of these uh, three quantities are going to uh, cause shear. Uh, the lift and drag also cause uh, the bending, which is the predominant effect. But 
uh, be, uh, this is because of the bending moment diagrams that you draw. Then you also have the shear force diagrams, which from which you see at any given cross section, you have a certain shear force in one direction L, another direction D. So there is a basically uh, uh, an equivalent uh, force that is coming because of both of these, and that shear force has to be resisted through a shear stress, which is what. Uh, these uh, skin elements are good at handling. Similarly, the moment also, the pitching moment from a uh, aircraft point of view, it's a pitching moment, but from a structural point of view, it's basically a torque and therefore a torque uh, applied to any uh, closed uh, section like this or even an open section will cause a shear stress. Just that when you have a closed cross section, the shearing um, uh, uh, stiffness is much larger and therefore you, the amount of deflection will be much lesser. So there will be a flow of the shear around this to kind of counteract the moment, pitching moment that is actually happening. Now, uh, does that answer your question or? You still have any doubts on that? Yes, sir. I'm getting it now. So the finally, finally, the top and bottom portion of the cover skin mm -hmm. is going to act as a board screen. I mean, the, including the spars. Yeah, the spar webs. So the okay. spar is uh, or consisting of two parts: the spar web and the spar caps. The spar caps are like fl uh, flanges of an I section beam. They predominantly contribute to handling the bending loads, whereas the spar uh, webs along with the uh, cover skin are going to form this closed cell which is going to uh, so this is i'm just talking about this uh, particular uh, portion uh, one cell over here uh, but there is remember there's one cell over here the second cell over here third cell over here so what i've uh, shown here is just the second cell so all these three uh, closed cells uh, work in partnership sharing that load let's say this m is equal to a particular torque let's say t naught uh, so that T naught will be shared as T one, T two, T three, so that T one plus T two plus T three will be equal to your T naught. But the predominant uh, portion will be shared by your um, the uh, main box beam that is there, which is uh, the two that I uh, plotted over there. So that's as far as the torque is concerned. Uh, but lift and drag are also causing the shear forces, which are also causing the shear stresses. So essentially, um, at a given point in the material, all that it is looking at as three shear stresses and three normal stresses where it comes from it doesn't care but it is experiencing that is the material capable of withstanding that is all that we are trying to explore as part of the flight vehicle structures or as a materials engineer even now um, that particular thing that uh, even though these are two different sources uh, lift drag and uh, on the one hand which are forces and moment which is a uh, uh, torque uh, the pitching moment which is a torque all of these are essentially causing similar kind of stresses because if you look at um, the drag what it is doing to this uh, top um, uh, skin is basically it's causing a force in this direction that is this like similar to this tau ij similarly this uh, pitching moment that is there will have to be resisted by that skin so that is also causing a, a certain uh, shear stress in the same direction in other words these are algebraically summed over the tau ijs uh, so similarly whatever is coming from the lift as well so you always go back to your strength of materials treat this just as a cantilever beam to start with a fixed end a free end which is basically the end which is attached to the fuselage the end which is uh, the wing tip and now uh, the real load is actually a pressure distribution and a, a shear distribution which you, uh, you are getting an equivalent uh, uh, lift drag and moment which are distributed along the length as we uh, showed in this example of the drag over here and the lift distribution over here uh, similarly the pitching moment can also be plotted versus the uh, y direction the uh, span direction now in all of these cases uh, the, you just treat it as a beam and as usual you draw your shear force diagram bending moment diagram and then decide at a given cross section what would be the most efficient way of tackling this uh, should you have a closed cross section which you would for example if you have a very large torque um, 
or should you have an open cross section which is good enough if let's say you are having uh, predominantly only the bending loads and which direction the bending is dominating again it will change from uh, uh, the phase of flight to on another phase of flight even in the same type of aircraft and from a type of aircraft to aircraft so then you make those design decisions in terms of what is um, uh, of course the outer shape that is sh i have shown in green over here is something dictated by the aerodynamics but the inner configuration in terms of how much thickness you should have at which location how many stringers you should have where you should put them uh, what is the sizing of those stringers etc the spar caps etc all of these are designed uh, des uh, designed by the structural engineer uh, who uh, makes the decision based on these shear force diagrams bending moment diagrams the uh, torsional diagrams the uh, torsional moment diagrams along the uh, span and uh, then you also have to make uh, decisions regarding the choice of material so the choice of material and the geometry uh, inner geometry is basically uh, decided by on on these basis of the stresses which are occurring because of these uh, predominant loads the lift drag and the moment is that clearer now Yes, sir. Much okay. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Samanwar. Yes, sir. Uh, due to pitching, uh -huh. uh, bending is creating. Yeah. And due to bending, up the bending stresses are generating. Okay. So you are so you are kind of taking that bending stress as a shear stress in this element, which you have taken. Yeah. On the skin. Uh -huh. Skin. That bending stress is actually a shear stress. Then we can design. Uh, no, uh, see, uh, let me just start a new one. See, all that you are uh, having is this. They say this is basically a wing plan form, right? Now, this is the fuselage to which it is attached. And now there is a uh, lift distribution and a drag distribution like this. So I can idealize this whole structure um, uh, into, let's say, just a cantilever beam okay in which uh, there is an airflow in this particular direction so basically what we are saying is that in this uh, let's also give it certain names let's say this is y this is uh, the z direction this is the velocity of the air now <coughs> you have y into z basically let's say the x direction is basically let's say like this so now um, if you look at this um, configuration you're basically having a three-dimensional beam right now this three-dimensional beam what is uh, three-dimensional in the sense that the loads coming in all uh, different directions right now um, what is happening is there is a lift distribution which is basically a force uh, in the z direction or rather the negative z direction which is like this which is a distributed force which is uh, let's say l of y right similarly you have a, a force distribution in the x direction um, i'll uh, draw that separately so that it's not kind of confusing so on the same uh, wing you have a force which is force distribution which is coming like this um, it could be uh, in any shape depending upon how the uh, configuration or the uh, tapering is done how the airfoil uh, changes along the length etc but basically you are having a drag distribution as well which is also d of y right and then you are having a pitching moment distribution which is uh, basically the torque that is created which is basically uh, the uh, torque about the x-axis right so that is m of x uh, mx rather mx is the pitching moment because it's uh, about the x direction it's a uh, uh, whereas the lift is a f is basically your fz right it's the z direction um, uh, force and similarly your uh, drag is basically nothing but a force in the x direction but a function of y which is y is being along the uh, le uh, the span of the uh, aircraft so now uh, you have that right now 
Uh, similarly, uh, here also along the uh, y direction, you will have a certain uh, uh, pitching moment. I am just drawing all of them in an arbitrary fashion, vary a lot from aircraft to aircraft and also flight phase to flight phase. Now, this uh, MX is basically going to be um, a large torque that you have over here uh, and slowly probably reducing uh, in size uh, and uh, probably becoming a very small torque as you go over there. Now, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the, this is a pitching moment, so this should be MY, I'm sorry. This yeah, so this is a pitching moment that is there, and this is also a function of y in general. Now, as far as so, this is from purely from coming from the aerodynamicist. Uh, you have a certain airfoil which generates a certain lift. With this is how it varies along the length. This is a and it has a certain L by D ratio, and therefore this is how the drag distribution is going to be along the length where the airfoil changes um, uh, in general and also the uh, even if it's the same airfoil the uh, cord length of the airfoil can change uh, going from a very large value at the uh, root to a smaller value at the uh, tip now all of these are going to uh, uh, be provided by the aerodynamicist in terms of the load uh, for the uh, structural engineer now as a structural engineer what uh, is typically expected of you is to look at uh, these uh, distributions just treat this as a beam and how can this beam react to all of these now just uh, whether we call it lift or drag at the end of the day for a structural engineer it is just a force distribution in two different directions now that force distribution any cantilever beam uh, if you uh, let's say take a new one it's just going to become um, a beam with um, just one distributed load if you take the equivalent of the lift and the drag in a particular direction you're going to get just a, um, a force distribution that is there on uh, on this and similarly a torque uh, distribution that is there and for this I have to design any particular cross section so and again I do not have complete freedom the outer uh, cross section is already defined by the aerodynamics now I can play around with how I place the materials materials inside the thickness of the skin as well as the uh, stiffening structures now the whole idea is that it should be able to withstand the stresses which are coming now what are the dominant stresses coming to your main question now th those dominant um, stresses one is because of the lift and the drag there is going to be uh, let's say uh, you have uh, let's say a, a shear force which is going to be something like this and then you're going to have a bending moment also which is going to come from that uh, sorry this Will be much more complex than that depending on the distribution you're basically uh, integrating that so you'd have uh, some kind of uh, um, distribution let's let's say so basically you're having a shear force uh, diagram yeah so this is your shear force diagram where you're plotting um, the equivalent shear force as a function of y you would have some kind of an arbitrary distribution that is basically coming over there similarly you have a coming from the same thing you are having a some kind of a bending moment uh, diagram uh, which is your m of y which is also going to uh, be important now you know from purely from a strength of materials point of view all that this shear force is going to do at any given cross section it has to be resisted by that material in that cross section and that resistance is going to be uh, provided by uh, generating shear stresses so this leads to uh, certain shear stresses tau ij whereas it's also going to cause the same lift and drag are causing the bending moment which in turn is going to cause some sigma i i as well that is basically the normal stresses so at any given point you will have three normal stresses in general and three shear stresses in general which are generated from the um, 
This is the bending moment diagram in which we are plotting m versus y. Now, both of these are going to uh, together at any given uh, point. If you take a small infinitesimal element of material over there, that infinitesimal amount of material that you have is going to basically uh, result in certain shear stresses that are going to act over there and certain normal stresses that are going to act over there in general varying from face to face uh, i've just drawn a two-dimensional picture over here in general it's a three-dimensional state of stress that you could uh, be having which where of course some some of the stresses are negligible compared to the other we'll come to all of that um, in much more detail later i'm just trying to give you a glimpse of what uh, to expect uh, while i'm trying to answer your question as well uh, is, does that answer you someone yes sir yes sir okay thank you welcome Uh, do you see my slides once again? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Slides. Yes, sir. The cover skin uh, frames, stringers, etc. Do you see that? No. No, sir. Uh, let me stop sharing and reshare it so that because I was doing that on a different. Uh, Sir, you should uh, again uh, present that slides. Yeah. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I'm able to see it. Yes, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so let's continue. So we said that it partly transmits, partly resists. What does it transmit? It transmits the aerodynamic pressure and the shearing stresses to the stiffeners. Um, uh, including the spark caps, of course, um, not only the stringers. Then uh, what is it resist? It resists uh, because it's a thin shell. Uh, it's not good at resisting. You can see if you have, a, let's say, a very uh, thin sheet of paper like this, let's say, uh, you know that it can uh, resist a good amount of uh, tension, but it cannot take compression. And bending always involves both tension and compression, so it's not going to uh, be a, a good at uh, bending. But it's very good at uh, resisting shear as well. Um, especially when it is stiffened at the uh, ends, it's able to resist the shear quite well and um, uh, contribute once it's a part of a box, it's able to contribute towards resisting the torque as well. Now, uh, that's basically what we are saying, that it resists the torque as well as the shear forces. The third thing that it does, which is a, a secondary uh, function of it, is that it will enhance the bending stiffness that is already provided by the longerons and the spar caps. So the longerons and the spar caps are the ones which are going to take the predominant amount of the bending, which is uh, uh, in essence, they are experiencing it as tension and compression. So if it's the um, wing the, uh, uh, under a cruise flight, it's predominantly the lift distribution, which is basically the um, uh, top being under compression. So any, all the stringers on the uh, top surface that you see over here, this one, this one, this one over here, all of these are going to uh, basically uh, be experiencing compression whereas the uh, stringers on the bottom surface are going to be experiencing tension but what is the source the bending which in turn what is the source it is basically the lift distribution and the drag distribution so uh, which in turn is basically whatever the um, environment that is the air uh, how it is acting on that surface so it's basically a chain that is happening it's uh, purely from our understanding point of view to make certain structural material decisions that we need to uh, go in this particular path but essentially what it is doing is that it is taking the bending loads now that uh, the these stringers as well as the uh, spar caps are taking the predominant amount of bending but the skin also has a certain non-zero area. It has a finite area, right? So that can add to the bending stiffness of the 
strangers. So it's not its primary function to take bending. Its primary function is to um, resist these torques and shear forces from a load carrying capability and to transmit the rest, right? Now, uh, but it does not transmit it entirely. It, it also helps in, um, helps the stringers and spars partly in taking the bending loads. Uh, is that clear? Any questions on that? Okay, uh, let's go on to the stiffening members now. So we just covered the cover skin. Now we go on to uh, one by one the stiffening members. Let's start with the longitudinal stringers and longerons. Again, uh, there's going to be certain thing which it's going to resist and pro probably certain things in some cases where it is going to transmit. So always think of these uh, three from uh, the example that I gave in terms of either light or heat, uh, conduction, convection, radiation, or uh, in the case of light, it's basically transmission, reflection, absorption. Uh, so similarly, the mechanical load is getting distributed in a certain uh, fashion, partly taken by the element itself on to which it is acting and partly to whatever it is joined to now as far as the stringers or longerons are concerned um, uh, we said that in the previous class uh, they, they are uh, for all practical purposes they are one and the same in terms of their uh, structural behavior just that the longerons are typically um, uh, through the entire length or almost the entire length of a structure uh, let's say the wing uh, or the fuselage but uh, the stringers are typically um, cut off because there are cutouts uh, let's say with the door or the window or any other attachments that are coming up and so you do not have uh, a, long, a particular longeron which is running all through it's uh, getting cut off at a particular location these are strong, small uh, relatively shorter ones but still beam like structures in other words their cross-sectional dimension if you look at the uh, cross-section it could be a hat like structure the cross-sectional area is very small uh, if you take the square root of the cross-sectional area it's very small compared to its length or its uh, wavelength of vibration if it's a vibrating problem so in either case you're basically uh, able to uh, um, uh, let's say uh, simplify the problem into a one-dimensional problem instead of a three-dimensional problem purely from that uh, stringers point of view now in either case, it's basically a one dimensional structure which can resist the uh, tension or the compression. So in the case of the top ones, it's mostly under compression, uh, though, of course, when it, the aircraft is on the ground, it's the self weight which is there. And therefore, actually, the top ones will be under tension. The bottom will be under compression. Right. But uh, the dominant loads when you're, let's say, uh, doing certain maneuvers or whatever, or even in cruise flight, you would have um, the self weight of the wing is um, small compared to the lift that it generates. The lift that it generates is almost equal to the weight of the entire aircraft. Uh, yeah. Sir, this is Vignesh. Yes, Vignesh. This is Vignesh. Yes, Vignesh. So, uh, the spar uh, winds are uh, uh, positioned uh, at places where the moments are high, is it? Uh, and what happens in uh, different kind of air points? So, uh, uh, let's say... You asked about the spar or the uh, stringer? Uh, uh, the spar winds. Uh, uh, the spar Spar webs. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So, um, yeah, very good question because these locations also matter. It's not just the geometry of each cross section of each of these components which matter, but where you position them, right? So, if you position the web, let's say, uh, much far uh, towards the nose of the uh, airfoil, uh, at some, are you able to see my uh, cursor as well when I move it? Yes, okay, excellent. Yeah. So, so when you when we move this uh, forward, uh, the advantage is that you are getting a bigger box. But as you move forward, you know that the mm, thickness of the airfoil is coming down. So the, the the size of the spar itself, the web itself, will uh, start coming down. So there is a certain um, uh, design uh, decision that you have to make. Uh, typically, these are done through optimization codes, uh, and uh, you would have to position it in certain way that you are trying to maximize the effect of this, the whole uh, um, ability of this box to be able to resist a certain torque and its ability to resist uh, the shear stresses which are coming predominantly in the case of the spar web it is taking the shear stresses which are coming from the lift whereas this uh, top skin and the bottom skin are predominantly resisting the shear forces which are coming from the drag 
so these um, uh, things are uh, design decisions which are made on uh, based on that in terms of where they are actually located uh, uh, is that the main question that you asked uh, that is the first question okay the second question was what happens in the case of uh, different kind of air foils, let's say yeah. uh, asymmetric air foils or air foils with much thinner cross section. Yeah. Because uh, air foils are chosen according to the uh, aircraft uh, or the uh, Reynolds number or the flow uh, uh, in which the, the vehicle goes, right? So, That's correct. So, uh, what, what about the different kind of air foils? Yeah. Uh, how, how, what happens there? Right, right. See, the airfoil, um, as you very rightly pointed out, depending upon the uh, Reynolds number, Mach number regimes that this aircraft is typically going to operate at, is decided by the aerodynamic system. So, the outer um, shell is going to be dictated by the aerodynamicist. But in terms of the thickness of the airfoil, the aerodynamicist will not tell you anything. The thickness is entirely the structural material engineer's perspective, um, where they decide how this thickness is going to be and it need not be this uh, in this particular example it is shown to be a uniform thickness along the entire surface of the um, airfoil to whatever portion it's uh, given uh, the trailing edge is not shown over here but um, basically you are seeing that it's the same uh, thickness over here but that need not be the case you can have varying thickness along the um, as you move along the uh, surface of this cover skin and similarly in the the spar web need not be of the same thickness as the cover skin all these are uh, design decisions which have to be made by the structural engineer based on the uh, specific uh, loading situation that is there at that particular cross section so from the lift distribution drag distribution and pitching moment distribution we know uh, from a structural point of view at this cross section uh, the constraints that i have as a structural engineer structural design engineer is that i am having this outer shape defined to me i have the load defined to me now all the freedom that i have is what materials i choose uh, which could be not just a single material combination of materials and then um, how i distribute them geometrically within this cross section so that you still have uh, a small mass per unit length of this uh, wing which is basically the cross-sectional mass density right now that uh, distribution you do not want to put more thickness at locations where the stresses are low so you will decide based on and and this is again the stress depends again on the thickness whereas the thickness where you want to put more thickness will depend upon where the large stress is so this is a kind of an iterative process or rather um, an optimization problem where you try to uh, ensure that um, the stress distribution is kind of equanimous you do not want certain regions to be under very large stress and certain to be under very low stress what it means is that where it is very large stress it is prone to failure which is uh, a no-no from a certification point of view and certain areas where you're putting um, material which is very less stressed which means that you are over designing it you're carrying more material than required so the optimization should uh, ensure that you uh, start with a certain baseline configuration let's say constant thickness uh, throughout and then you start seeing which locations are more stressed which locations are less stressed at locations which are more stressed you increase the thickness in a particular way or add more stiffeners see the spacing of the stiffeners is also important so just like the spacing that i talked about in answering your first question where to put the spar itself similarly the, in terms of how far one uh, spar is from the other spar how far is one stringer from another stringer which is basically the pitching the pitch of that um, uh, placement of the stringers now that all of that again are design decisions so in regions which are highly stressed you want to put uh, the stringers much closer to each other in regions which are uh, less stressed you might want to space out the stringers uh, much farther from each other or you keep the same uh, string uh, spacing of the stringers but change this cross-sectional uh, size you have a much smaller uh, cross-section at locations which are less stressed and much larger cross-sectional area of the stringer where uh, the 
the stress is more so there are many uh, there's not one single solution see uh, uh, even though we are constrained by so much by the aerodynamics defining the outer shape and the loads still there is so much of freedom for us to play around with so many design parameters in terms of the material choices as well as the inner geometry that uh, we can arrive at um, uh, if not an optimal a very near optimal solution so that we minimize the uh, cross sectional weight density is that clear right, sir. thank you okay. yeah thank you thank you for this welcome so, uh, continuing with the uh, uh, stringers and longerons, the main uh, function is that they resist the axial loads and the bending loads. For example, in a uh, helicopter rotor kind of configuration, uh, more the important than the bending loads sometimes can be the axial load because this is uh, the rotor blade is rotating at a certain RPM. The centrifugal forces that are coming will basically be a tensile uh, force, which is an axial load, which will um, add up to the, um, the loads which are coming due to bending. So the bending moment diagram uh, means that you have a certain uh, distribution of tension and compression the axial uh, load is going to give a pure tension throughout and that um, uh, is going to superimpose on each other in terms of the overall load at a particular cross section and then you have to take uh, all of them into account and many of these problems can be geometrically non-linear problems so you cannot uh, solve each of them separately and then try to uh, put them together by the principle of superposition which will not work in a non-linear problem like that uh, and as you stress it closer and closer to the materials limits, again, the material nonlinearity will also kick in and uh, uh, you have to start with all of these loads simultaneously. Whereas in your strength of materials, you tell, dealt with let's say the um, the shear force uh, alone what is the effect the bending moment alone what is the effect the uh, torsion alone what is the effect uh, but now all of these are acting simultaneously and need to be taken uh, together uh, in our course also we will uh, divide this to understand each one of these and later on uh, at the end uh, come back and see how when all of these are acting simultaneously how to uh, take that them into account right from the beginning stage the next um, thing that the uh, stringer or longeron does is it increases the buckling strength of the skin okay see the skin uh, uh, is a panel it's basically just a panel like this um, it's very poor in compression uh, so uh, the buckling load is very very small of course I have a very thin skin over here but you would have probably a little uh, better uh, to deal with but what uh, you know that uh, for example even in a column let us say uh, if there is a column under compression uh, you push this uh, column down you are you're going to you have, have a certain buckling load let us say this is simply supported in that case you have a pi squared ei by l squared otherwise you have a certain uh, factor of uh, factor coming in depending on the different boundary conditions now in that pi squared ei by l squared leave out the ei bending stiffness but the l squared that is there shows that the shorter the length you're going to have a larger buckling lo uh, failure load which means that it can resist much more compression before it uh, basically uh, uh, destabilizes uh, in an elastic sense and buckles right and this buckling need not necessarily be a flexural buckling uh, it could sometimes be a torsional buckling also it could just twist uh, and uh, it could be buckling in this direction or it could be buckling in the uh, other direction as well We'll come into all these nuances later but the um, important point at this context in this context is that if you have a shorter length you're going to have a much uh, delayed buckling same thing in the case of a, uh, let's say a panel like this now if you have a panel like this now the panel size will dictate when this buckles if you have a much smaller panel like this that smaller panel is going to buckle um, at a much higher load so what you're effectively doing by stiffening is that now in on this uh, bigger panel you're putting a stiffener here putting a stiffener here a stiffener here so you're having a smaller panel over there now this smaller panel means that it will buckle much later so in essence by placing the stringers you are reducing the effective size of the panel so in, in uh, indirectly you are increasing the uh, buckling strength of the skin uh, is that clear uh, any, anybody has any doubts on this okay 
Next, uh, we uh, the third function of the stringers or the longerons is that it arrests the crack growth in the skin by taking excessive axial tension. So once again, let's uh, look at the same example. You have a, a panel here. You have two stiffener, uh, let's say two stringers over here. Now these two stringers, what they're going to do is, suppose there is a crack which starts here and that crack is slowly growing because let's say this is under tension. So this tension is going to uh, pull this apart. Now this tension uh, pulling it apart basically means that it is going to in, uh, uh, make the crack length larger and larger what we call as the crack growth now that crack growth if there are two stiffeners let us say over here now as the crack grows it encounters that stiffener and then therefore it it has to go around the stiffener or it has to uh, destroy the interface between the stiffener and the skin so it becomes a little more difficult for the crack to grow so in other words it either slows down that crack growth or it completely arrests that so in that sense uh, the crack might be within manageable limits um, uh, before the aircraft lands for example so you uh, you can then do a composite patch repair or whatever to uh, ensure that it's taken care of or replace a particular panel entirely if it if the crack is uh, fairly large so uh, this is the third function that you have where you are, are able to arrest the crack growth in the skin by taking the excess axial tension so whatever uh, tension is there on the um, on the skin that excess tension is taken away by these stringers which are there so these are the three uh, major functions of the stringer or the longeron now oops yeah now let's look at these spars which are uh, almost similar to the stringers just that the, it's a kind of an amplified stringer it's a much bigger so if you look at this example you see the spar flange over here the spar flange is a cross-sectional area which is larger compared to an individual stringer. But there are many stringers. So if you sum them all up, the stringers might still be doing a better job. But individually, if you compare one stringer with one spar uh, cap, let us say, there, or we, we call it a spar cap, but basically it means that it is the flange of an eye section, relatively speaking. So that um, cross-sectional area of the flange, each flange, is going to be much larger compared to that of a stringer. So it, it has the same three functions that you see over here of the stringer, but in an with an amplified functionality because of its larger cross-sectional area. The second aspect is about this other part of the spar, which is the web. Now that web is going to resist the torque and the shear along with the skin. That's what we talked about in that um, uh, drawing that I did. Uh, it may not have been a very good drawing, but um, nonetheless, I think it conveyed the essence of what we are trying to do. You have one box over here, which I called as one, another box over here, which I call as two, which is the major wing box, so to speak. The, and here you have uh, actually three spars that you uh, see in this di diagram, whereas I showed for simplicity just two spar, um, which is good enough for a smaller uh, aircraft uh, or a smaller card length. Now you have three spars over here. You see this particular thing. So there is one uh, wing box with these spars over here, another wing box over here. They all distribute the um, uh, torsional load between themselves. So these um, are going to take the transverse uh, shear stresses as well as the um, shear stress which is coming because of the torque. So the two sources, but the effect is the same, uh, qualitatively speaking, uh, in terms of both are generating shear stresses. And shear stresses are very well taken by uh, these uh, panels. And uh, shear stresses coming from torque especially are very well taken by closed cross sections like these. Unlike let's say you have an open cross section which is much poorer in um, uh, torsion as uh, many of you would have studied and we will revisit that problem in a different context later. Uh, is this clear about the spars as well? Any doubts on the spar? <laughs> okay. Finally, let's move on to the ribs. Now, these are transverse uh, structures. Uh, you see at the back of this, um, the, uh, a rib is shown, which is basically perpendicular to the span of the aircraft. So this is the wing. 
Now, in, in the, this is the span of the wing. This is, uh, my body is the fuselage, let's say. This is the entire wing. This is the wing root. This is the wing tip, right? Now, this is the span of the wing. And at certain cross sections, you place certain stiffeners, which are almost the entire cross section. In some cases, they could be smaller. Now, these are basically supporting structures which maintain the shape of that airfoil because otherwise because the skin is also undergoing certain stress the shape of the skin uh, from being an original airfoil kind of a cross section can uh, start deforming and may not perform its aerodynamic function uh, effectively so what you need to do is to put something inside to so that uh, it kind of becomes a transfer stiffener now the uh, ability of the skin to um, uh, change its shape uh, or size is uh, much reduced but you can't have this entire thing filled up throughout that if you have a solid wing let us say uh, two things one it increases the weight tremendously and it also occupies a space which would otherwise be occupied by fuel for example or uh, the control um, uh, lines which are running from the aircraft pilot's control to the control surfaces on the wing now uh, you need that space so uh, the other more important thing of course is that a weight consideration so you have a hollow structure uh, mostly but at least at certain locations you want to have these uh, transfer stiffness the first function of that is to maintain the cross-sectional shape the other is uh, we, d we just touched upon it very briefly in a previous class that you need these transfer stiffness especially in, uh, in the aircraft let's say an engine is hanging over here now that engine is going to cause um, a thrust and a self weight of the engine which is going to act on that um, uh, particular location where it is joined through pylons now that particular location unless and until you put transfer stiffeners over those locations as well you're going to have a concentrated load which is going to deform the skin by a very large amount and um, it's going to be a disaster so that is another function that you distribute uh, the concentrated loads into the skin by using these transverse frames or ribs in the case of um, the uh, wing or the um, uh, stabilizers that is the yaw stabilizer and the uh, the um, uh, the pitch stabilizer uh, what are commonly called as the vertical tail and the horizontal tail in all of these cases you would have certain concentrated loads which are coming up uh, for example because of the control surfaces as well right now those control surfaces uh, in the case of the uh, stabilizers are going to be the rudder and the elevator they are going to cause uh, where they are attached to the uh, stabilizers that is the tails they will cause concentrated loads as well that has to be distributed and usually it is done by providing these transverse stiffening elements called as ribs here and called as formers or frames or even rings in the case of uh, the fuselage and when they cover a large portion of the fuselage cross-section itself or maybe the entire cross-section of the fuselage we tend to call them as bulkheads but essentially they're all performing the same function it's purely from a just like how the distinction that we had between stringer and launcher there can be uh, other differences which uh, different industries take up or uh, the users take up but um, uh, predominantly they from a structural point of view all that we see of them is these are beams and similarly these are transfer stiffeners what do they do uh, they maintain the cross-sectional shape one the other is they help to distribute the concentrated loads into the skin so now suppose uh, the wing is attached at this particular location uh, between this um, uh, frame or ring and this frame or ring usually uh, you would not uh, just do with a frame or a ring you would go for a uh, much larger cross section what could be a bulkhead for example but let's say for just for uh, explanation between these two you are joining uh, the wing uh, over here and the load which is coming from the link wing uh, which is the entire lift integrated over one half of the wing and the entire drag the entire pitching moment is now going to act on the skin unless and until 
you do, had these now because these are there these are uh, first experiencing the load coming from the wing and then gradually distributing it in a uh, almost smooth fashion to the skin otherwise the skin would have failed over here very similar to the example that we saw of the engine hanging over the wing now the wing is hanging over the fuselage so this transmission also has to happen through these kinds of frames or ribs the third thing is it redistributes the stresses around structural discontinuities. Uh, we saw a simple example of that uh, in the previous class. Suppose between this stringer over here, this stringer over here, this uh, frame over here and this frame over here, you had let us say a window cut out or let us say uh, you take away these stringers and make a, make a much bigger uh, cut out which is let us say a door cut out. Now, when you have such kind of um, structural discontinuities, in other words, the, the skin is continuous, suddenly there needs to be an opening for certain purpose. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, in the case of where you attach the tray, the uh, control surfaces over here, uh, etc. So, in all those situations, you have a structural discontinuity. This uh, continuous structure is having a break at certain points and therefore, you need to redistribute the stresses over there. And just like the stringers, the transverse stiffeners also play a role in a different direction. So, even the crack growth that we uh, talked about, for example, earlier, uh, here arresting a crack growth in the skin in, a in this direction. Now, if there is a crack growth in this direction, these uh, stiffeners, which are the, um, the frames or formers or rings, will uh, resist that uh, crack growth in that particular direction. And also, just like we saw here, the longitudinal stringers and longerons are incre increasing the buckling strength of the skin in a particular direction. That is, in this direction, it will not buckle. So, so in the same thing, you're, you're having stringers like this. Now, these two stringers are going to increase the buckling strength of the skin in this direction. But there is also going to be a buckling strength in this uh, important in this direction as well, because there are, there can be compressive loads coming in that direction. And that the two. Uh, stiffeners uh, which are there in the form of the transverse ribs in the case of the wing or the two uh, frames or uh, rings that are there in the case of the fuselage now these two are going to shorten that length that pi squared e by l squared formula the l is going to be shortened uh, uh, that formula of course doesn't apply for a panel or skin uh, which is a two-dimensional structure as opposed to a column which is a one-dimensional structure but effectively it trans translates to that uh, as you reduce the panel size you go from a panel like this to a panel like this all that you're basically doing is that you're having a short, smaller panel and therefore delayed buckling and uh, delayed buckling in one direction through placing stringers delayed buckling in the other direction by placing transverse uh, ribs so this is um, the uh, fourth function coming to the fifth function it helps the skin in taking the hoop stress now uh, as i mentioned in the previous class uh, these aircraft are flying at higher altitudes uh, which are lower pressure which is um, uh, not amenable uh, to passengers occupying it for example so you need to internally pressurize this and when you internally pressurize this that is going to create a hoop stress which is basically the cross section uh, having a stress in um, along uh, its walls so that uh, tensile loading is going to uh, of course increase the buckling strength which is good in a way but it creates a certain tensile stress and that has to be handled some way the skin is handling most of it but now by putting these uh, stiffeners along along its uh, surface at certain locations it will help the skin in taking that hoop stress as well in, in a much better fashion uh, so i think uh, with that probably uh, we'll conclude it if there are any questions i'll be happy to take that Anybody? Any questions? I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess. There are no questions. Okay, uh, sure. Um, uh, Bharat, Bharat has a question. Yes, yeah. please. Yes, please, Bharat. Go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, 
sir, can you explain again how the crack growth is uh, arrested in, in both the cases, in both longitudinal, I mean, sorry, the longitudinal stages and also in the rich? Sure, sure, yeah. So let me try to draw it over here itself. Now you see there is. Oops. Uh, now, do you see this is one stringer? This is another stringer, right? Now, let's say I put a rib over here and I put a rib over here, right? And now, uh, let's say okay, now let's say there is a crack which is coming up like this, right? Now, as this crack starts growing, it hits the transverse rib. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it hits the transverse rib, which is much stiffer than the uh, and stiffer and stronger than compared to the uh, the skin, right? Because the skin is very thin. That has a much larger cross section there, and so it hits that. So the uh, ability of that to go beyond that is kind of either postponed or completely avoided so you don't have this at all so that is basically what uh, is is happening over there for a crack along this span those are um, arrested or delayed by the transverse ribs now on the other hand let's take one more panel over here okay now there is a crack in this direction let us say that is along the cord direction now this crack is also trying to grow because the it is uh, a crack which is in the presence of mechanical loads remember so th uh, the mechanical loads tend to accentuate that and the crack starts growing it comes and hits let's say the spark cap over here or it hits the stringer over here on this direction both of which the spar cap over here as well as the um, stringer over here are much stiffer and stronger compared to this uh, this because of their larger cross-sectional sizes okay this is not we're talking about not necessarily the material it could be made of the same material so the same it could have the same ultimate tensile strength it could have the same yield strength etc um, uh, that, that's not the point but from a uh, point of view of the ability to resist that crack in terms of the size of that structure itself the geometry helps it to be being much um, larger cross-sectional dimension compared to the uh, skin panel itself because which is very thin it is able to delay the crack to grow beyond that in this direction as well as this direction is that clear Right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, we will probably uh, stop the class with this. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm actually from undergraduate department yeah. and I mailed you about attending this course mm -hmm. for uh, as we have uh, to complete some compulsory engineering credits right so uh, but as you said as you mentioned that you we already passed like six hours of lectures and mm -hmm. you already posted the videos i yeah. watched the videos okay but i did not get the assignment you said that is due that was due last thursday actually and also yeah. like if it was in this it was in the second class um, yeah. so if you look at that uh, video you will be able to see uh, see that uh, somewhere so um, uh, otherwise i'll ask uh, one of the teaching assistants to share that assignment with you uh, this particular student um, has joined uh, after um, uh, we had uh, for three or four classes so please uh, try to help him out with that assignment uh, though he can actually see that in the video if he goes to the second uh, video because it's one of the slides of that video the assignment is uh, listed over there 
so uh, you can just talk to the teaching assistants who are um, Rajesh, Renuka, and Vignesh. Any one of them uh, will be able to help you with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, to add to the answer, we have a yeah i think that okay, is the best I, instead of uh, talking I, to any one of them individually if you send it to that um, uh, common uh, mail any one of them who sees the that first will respond to you once. come again Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you all. Um, we'll catch up again in the next class on Thursday. Bye. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Most thank you, sir. Sure. Uttinjaya Mantra. Trembakam yajamahe sugandhim pushti vardhanam. Urvarukamiva Bandhana Rutyor Mukshiyama Murutat Yete Sahasrama Yutam Pasha Murutyo Martya Yahantave Tan Yagyasya Maya Yasarva Navayajamahe Murutyave Swaha Murutyave Swaha